For some, like French President Macron, the idea of a European Union army is seen as a new sense of urgency in the wake of the war in Ukraine, the continent's demographic decline, and especially since the US military is increasingly shifting its focus towards the Indo-Pacific region to counter China. In a way, he's right. EU states together would have about the same military budget as China and four times Russia's. For others, the idea of a EU army would simply be the overhead of 27 national administrations. It disorganized 27 individual full-scale militaries, somehow glued together. Essentially, Austria-Hungary on steroids. Geographically speaking, Europe is threatened on three axes. The southern Mediterranean border, the Aegean Sea, and of course, the eastern border with Russia. Since the EU perceives Putin's Russia as the biggest threat, could a EU army actually defeat the entire Russian military? Hi and welcome to History Legends. If you're new to this channel, make sure to check out my Ukraine playlist so you don't miss anything I've said in the past. And as you know, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to all those that have already helped and welcome to the headquarters. The language barrier. Before going to battle, you have to assemble your army. Yet a lot of people bring up the obvious language problem of uniting a fighting force with 24 official languages. And at first glance, it's a solid argument. In reality, it all depends how a European army would be structured. People imagine a European army like the Expendables with all the units mixed in together. Let's say some Polish soldiers mixed in with some Greeks, plus some guys from Ireland, and all these guys would be commanded by Swedish staff, aka the Austro-Hungarian scenario. In that case, it's true that language and even cultural barriers could pose a serious problem. Let's take a look at an already existing unit of this European army, the Franco-German Brigade. Here's how the unit is structured. They have two French regiments, 3e Regiment de Hussard and 1er Regiment d'Infanterie. These units are 100% French. Then you have two German Jäger Battalion and a full German Artillery Battalion. And there's another German unit, the Panzer Pioneer Company. Now the staff and the logistics battalion is bilingual. I'll mark it as bi. That way it follows the guidelines of THE MESSAGE. With that being said, the Franco-German Brigade never went to battle as a unit. We have no clue how the brigade would perform under enemy fire. Overall, it serves more of a ceremonial purpose, and it resembles the political vision of the Austro-Hungarian army as a tool of integration. Using historical examples, the best way would be to have battalions and brigades based on pre-existing national units, which greatly improves cohesion. Honestly, it's nothing new. For example, at the Battle of Waterloo, Irish, Scottish, English, Dutch, Belgian, German and Prussian soldiers all fought in their respective units to avoid unnecessary language problems. However, to plan the defeat of Napoleon's army, British and Prussian commanders like Wellington and Blücher had to communicate in French. And as a modern example, just look at the joint operations of NATO. And by default, the operational language of all these forces is always English. And that wasn't a problem in any international mission, whether it be in Iraq, Afghanistan or in the Sahel region. So no, the language barrier would not really be a problem if a European army was to face Russia. Europe can't win against Russia without the help of the United States. Comparing military equipment from a purely qualitative perspective is hard because there are so many factors involved in a fight, like training, doctrine and the tactical situation. For that reason, we'll focus on the quantitative standpoint. And in that regard, a EU army just makes sense. And sorry, British lads since brexit i can't include you guys in the tally maybe next time okay let's take a look at how many trained fighters each side can bring to the battlefield in terms of total military personnel surprisingly the balance of manpower would strongly favor a european army in terms of active personnel the soldiers already in the armed forces europe could bring 1.3 million men compared to russia's estimated 850,000. europe has 1.5 times more soldiers than russia does. Europe also has an advantage in terms of reserves. They can bring 1.6 million men compared to Russia's 1.2 million, especially thanks to countries like Austria, Finland and Greece that still have conscription. Thing is, to achieve this result, 
Europe will have to bring each and every one of the 27 countries to the fight. It's like that moment when you confront your bully and you tell him, if all my friends come, we'll beat you up. Then the bully just chuckles and says, if. But jokes aside, European forces also have a qualitative advantage. The overwhelming majority are volunteers that are all trained according to the same NATO standards and doctrines, with a strong emphasis on properly trading NCOs as they're the building block of any army. However, this argument can also be flipped, because the Russian military has now gained lots of military experience fighting a high-intensity war in Ukraine. And since they're essentially rotating all their combat units, this experience is spread across their entire army. So I'm asking you, what is better, combat experience or excellent training? Let me know in the comment section. Overall, Russia has 12,420 tanks available compared to Europe's 5,070, a number boosted by Soviet-era tanks from Eastern European countries. The only place where Russia holds a significant advantage is in terms of heavy equipment and material. They have a 2 to 1 superiority in tanks, or rather, had. Now, because of their losses in Ukraine, the Russians developed quick ways to repair damaged or destroyed tanks right on the field, and even refurbish enemy material, a skill that European armies have lost since they barely lost any tanks since World War II. Anyway, we're still waiting to see how Leopards 2 fair against Russian tanks. But as of today, quantity still matters. In that regard, interestingly enough, Europe actually has more armored vehicles. Europe has nearly 56,000 armored vehicles compared to Russia's 30,000. But the frightening comparison is about artillery. Russia has 2.5 times more artillery pieces than all EU members combined. We're talking two times more toward artillery, 2.5 times more self-propelled guns, and over three times more rocket artillery. We already had this discussion in the previous video, but European powers thought of artillery as a thing of the past and preferred to put the focus on aviation, which is very useful when facing fast-moving insurgents that have no anti-air capabilities. But the battlefield in Donbass confirmed historical data whenever fighting an equal foe, artillery plays an important role, just like during World War I and World War II. Not talking about the Air Force, the EU stands its ground in terms of fighter jets, but the Russians almost have the double amount of attack helicopters. Disclaimer, because of anti-air defenses of each side, the balance of power in the air is most likely going to be equal. Both countries are also sort of lagging behind in terms of UAV strength. We can even take a quick look at the Navy, even if in terms of a conflict, it wouldn't play that much of a role. Although Russian hypersonic missiles and stealth submarines could inflict significant damage on surface vessels. Europe has more aircraft and helicopter carriers. They also have more surface ships like destroyers and frigates. But the Russians have more submarines. So if we only look at the numbers, again, the Europeans could definitely face off the Russians. They could even go on the offensive. The problem they have compared to the Russians is that each country has a lot of different equipment, which is logistically complicated. This video is sponsored by Ground News. I present to you the world's first comparison platform. Not better news, but an app for a better way to read news. Every day, they gather more than 30,000 articles. For example, here in the top stories, you can see an article from The Independent. Are they typically more right or left-leaning? Or are they positioned at the center? To answer that question, Ground News has a biased distribution map that positions the entire media on the spectrum. Here you can see how the articles from the independent are generally center left. That's their bias. Now, if we go back to the article, the headline says, Russia warns that Sweden and Finland joining NATO would end nuclear-free Baltics. You can see how the article is marked having a bias on the left but you can also swipe to see other articles on the same topic. Now we have one from Reuters that is already a bit more neutral, and then another one from GB News, which has a right-wing bias. And if you want completely different stories, just scroll down. Ground News even detects when articles are overtly biased. This one has a 0% right-wing perspective, and the other one 0% left. And of course, you can always customize your experience by selecting the topics that are the most interesting to you. If just like me, you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events around the world, 
Download the free ground news app by clicking the link in the description below. Poor, com poor combat readiness and logistics. Let's take a look at the three strongest armies of Europe. According to global firepower, it's France, Italy, and then Germany. This article from the 25th of February says, if tomorrow Italy goes to war, only 1,400 soldiers from their army, navy, and air force would be ready for combat. That's 0.8% of their total armed forces. In terms of heavy equipment, Americans say that generally speaking, the acceptance level of combat readiness should be 80%. Yet, on the 18th of March, it was said that half the Italian army's tanks are not battle ready. Same for France. In theory, they have 406 tanks. But in reality, only 222 are available. Now, despite Germany being one of Europe's biggest military spender and the seventh in the world, on January 2nd, eight of the German army's 53 Tiger attack helicopters and 12 of the services, 99 NH-90 transports were war ready. If you want to take a look at the combat readiness of any military in the world, simply take a look at their air force. It is known that airplanes and helicopters require a lot of maintenance, and that's very expensive. And often it comes last. In mid-2018, just 10 of the German Air Force's 128 Eurofighter Typhoons were mission ready. At the same time, only 26 of the Air Force's 93 Tornado Fighter Bombers were ready. And like we said, from there, the problem extends to every branch. According to a 2018 report to the German parliament, 105 of the 224 Leopard 2 tanks and 5 of 13 frigates were ready. And the disaster was that none of the 6 German submarines were capable of being deployed. The Kriegsmarine is turning in its grave over and over. But talking about the problems of combat readiness of the German military is like beating a dead horse. Things were not so shiny for the Hexagon as well. The Americans claimed that France is a strong ally demonstrated by its willingness to put boots on the ground and thus ready to suffer casualties when most European countries are highly allergic to this idea. But they also claimed that the French military was stretched thin and its military could not sustain a long campaign. Up-to-date data regarding French readiness is very hard to find. It's like a black box. But we know that in 2017 there was 64% combat readiness for the Leclerc tanks, 57% for the AMX-10 RC, 70% for the VBCI, 70% for the Caesars, and 46% for the VABs. It's not horrific, but it's not ideal. And the American report was nice. They explained this low level because of the extreme conditions the French faced in the Sahel region, which wears out equipment at a much higher rate than in any other theater. The real problem is that despite an increase in budget, the French army cut back on the purchase of spare parts and delegated maintenance work to manufacturers. The system works by centralizing maintenance and providing vehicles to units only when and where they need them, as opposed to each unit possessing its own complete vehicle set and maintenance capabilities. That means if war was to start tomorrow, not every French mechanized brigade would be mechanized. And this is for Europe's best army! Now, artillery. A few press reports pointed to ammunition shortages. Some parliament members claimed that the French military would run out of ammo within four days. Meanwhile, the French Ministry of Defense simply refuted those claims, but remained very opaque about the situation. The head director of the French weapons manufacturer Nexter confirmed that the production of a batch of artillery shells would take between two and three years. So that's the situation for the top three EU armies. Just imagine the others. So if the Europeans were to face the Russians today, they would face significant problems because they would essentially be able to fight with 25% of their theoretical strength. And that's before casualties. And that makes EU armies highly dependent on the industrial output of the United States. We're talking about ammo, spare parts, you name it. Which makes the argument for NATO even more relevant. The lack of military cooperation. People often bring up the huge variety of standard issue rifles of European armies, like the Henkel MK556 for Germany, the HK416 for France, the Beretta AR7090 for Italy, and the FB Radom MSBS Grot for Poland. Not only are all these weapons modern, but they all use the same NATO ammo which strongly facilitates logistics if mass production was needed. Now in terms of heavy equipment, one of the first European projects was the Panavia Tornado multi-role combat aircraft, used from 1974 to 2011 by both Germany and Italy, and this cooperation has just been increasing in Europe ever since. 
For example, you have the Boxer Armored Vehicle Program that is also going to be ordered by Germany, the Netherlands, Lithuania, and Slovenia. Then you have the Italian-led SR communication program, which will soon be used in Finland, France, Germany, Poland, and Spain. There's also the European main battle tank, a hybrid combining the hull of a Leopard 2A7 with the lighter two-man turret of a Leclerc. Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, and Belgium are already interested in this. And the list goes on, the new Eurodrome will be used by Germany, Italy, France, and Spain, and the Dutch NH90 by Italy, Germany, France, and the Netherlands. Norway could have been on the list, but it took the Netherlands 20 years to deliver only 8 of the 14 helicopters they sold, even if the deadline was set for 2008, a delay of 14 years. Norway now wants a $525 million refund. Now this situation confirms the problems of industrial production of European powers. There are also production issues because, let's say a French weapons manufacturer wants to acquire a German competitor. The German government will block it to defend national interests, but that also means that European weapon manufacturers as a whole will be forever limited. And of course, the upcoming future combat air system is meant to replace France's Rafale, Germany's Eurofighter Typhoon, and Spain's FA-18 Hornet. Problem is, Italy, the UK, the Netherlands, Belgium, Norway, Poland, and even Germany are all replacing their fighter jets with American-made F-35s. And the only major military that doesn't want them is France. And they're pretty salty that all their European allies prefer to buy American instead of their French-made aircraft or even European productions. Even worse for the European project. In January 2022, Poland was reportedly excluded from the Franco-German main battle tank project. And this is why a couple months later, Warsaw ordered 250 M1 Abrams from the United States. And on the 26th of May 2022, the Polish Ministry of National Defense doubled down. They sent an inquiry to buy 500 HIMARS from the United States. For a long time, and especially since the war in Ukraine, we see an increasing divide between the vision of Western European countries and the ones located in Eastern Europe. Eastern European countries and the ones in the Baltic prefer closer ties with NATO, aka the United States, simply because they don't trust Western Europeans to back them up in case of a war. And they have a good point. But this picture wouldn't be complete if we didn't mention that for the United States. NATO is also a wonderful business opportunity to sell made in America equipment to rich European countries. And let's say that the idea of a European Union army does not benefit the Americans in any way. Who would be in command? Historically speaking, in any coalition, the country in charge is either the richest or the one with the biggest muscles. Ideally, both. Think of the role of the United States during World War II, both an economic and military giant. Now here are the top four economies of Europe by GDP. Germany is the richest, but like we've seen, France has the muscles, and that's the entire problem. Let's say for a second the French are in charge. Here's the list of all the EU countries against this idea. Hold on, let's say the Germans are in charge. Here's the list of all EU countries against this idea. What complicates things is that in Europe, the two strongest full-spectrum armies, that means Navy, ground forces, and air force, is France and Italy. And that adds a third player to the command structure. And then there are other armies that are 100% capable, but not just full-spectrum, like the German, Polish, and Spanish armies. The French noticed serious limitations in terms of how many men they could deploy on their own. Right after the Cold War, at their peak, during Operation Desert Storm, the French managed to deploy 18,000 men. And let's say the Americans put them to the side because they considered that this was not even a full force, like they were too lightly armed already. Since then, they can't effectively send more than 5,000 troops abroad. And the country often calls its allies for help in terms of transport and logistic capabilities. The French pushed the idea of a common EU defense initiative as a way to bolster their own ability to intervene and protect French interests all over the world from French Guyana to the Pacific Islands. However, subordinating European armies under French command structures will not mean that the rest of Europe would support French interests. And to add to this problem, France is the only country in the European Union with its own nuclear deterrence capabilities, and they're not ready to share it with any other country. And this is the deadlock situation. France wants to be the leader, 
and nobody wants France to be the leader. And that's why NATO works. The US is by far the strongest military power and the richest nation in the NATO alliance. This is the legitimacy to rule. And like that, the US acts like a binding glue for all European nations. And this makes leaders of all Eastern Europe and the Baltics very happy, especially since they view NATO as a way to contain Russia which is a potential threat right at their border. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description.